Welcome friends, welcome on the barricades. On today's special edition, we have a very special guest. It is Professor Richard Wolf. Professor Richard Wolf, Professor Emeritus at the um, uh, uh, Massachusetts University Amherst and also at New York State University, uh, is finally here with us to discuss a lot of the things that you probably wanted to ask him but never got the chance. Um, we also have as usual, our co-host, Boyan Stanislavski. Welcome, both of you. Thank you. Very glad to be here. Hi. Hello. So, uh, as agreed, we are going to discuss, of course, about economy, because as I think I already wrote in the description, economy is something usually used against the citizens, something used to tell us that we can't get a raise because then the inflation will go up, that we can't get maternity leave or we can't get social security or that we cannot tax the rich because then they are going to run away with their money and we are going to be left here alone and poor. So economy was always used as a tool to maintain the status quo. And it was used to maintain this status quo at the best interest of the elites, usually. And very few economists managed to do um, some, an analysis that would um, allow us to see things in a different way. Uh, uh, way. So um, Richard Wolf managed not only to make us look beyond this type of neoliberal orthodoxy in economy, but he also managed to present it in a way that it was um, appealing for the, to the public. It was appealing and interesting. And this is why uh, one of the reasons that we invited uh, him here. Now, the first question, my first question to you, Professor Wolf, because as I told you, I often discussed with you while listening to your lectures, and I often wondered, you talk about workers' co-ops. You, you talk a lot about workers' co-ops. Now, my question would be, look, if let's say we are all organized in workers' co-ops, but if we are, we are still trapped there to compete and we haven't changed the co uh, competitive production of profit, that is one of the uh, uh, core elements in capitalism, how are we going to change things in a radical way? Good. I'm glad you asked the question because it's one that comes to us fairly, fairly often. Um, and I think... There are two ways that I can go at this, but I, I'm going to try one, and then if it doesn't work, I'll try the other one. The proposal to change from a capitalist enterprise, and let's remember what a capitalist enterprise is. You have a very small minority. The owner of the business, if it's a single individual, a family, it could be if it's a corporation, then it's a board of directors, which is usually 10 to 20 individuals who are put in that position by the major shareholders, often banks and insurance companies. You put it all together, it's a tiny minority of our people own the businesses and run them. And the vast majority of us are employees. And so there has to be an honest recognition that the capitalist enterprise, the factory, the office, the store, is a fundamentally undemocratic institution. It does not permit the people in authority to be held accountable to the people over whom they govern. This is an extraordinary statement because it means that when countries like the United States go around the world, including in Eastern Europe, pretending that they are democratic, 
It is simply false. You know, most adults spend most of their lives at work. Five days or more a week, the best hours of those days, they are at work. If you wish to claim that you are a democratic society, democracy would have to be established in the workplace. It should have been done 200 years ago. It never was. Democracy, which is celebrated abstractly in the newspaper, in the university, and by the politicians, is kept away from the workplace which is an extraordinary reality. And one of the results of that reality is that the tiny minority that is not accountable, the boss in a company is not elected by the workers in that company. The board of directors of a corporation is not elected by the workers of a capitalist corporation. They are an unaccountable undemocratic aristocracy that runs business. And you should not be surprised that this aristocracy of the capitalist enterprise does for itself exactly what the aristocracies before capitalism did for themselves. They made a small number of people very powerful and very rich and they kept everybody else impoverished and without power. That's the history of monarchy. That's the history of feudalism in Eastern Europe, in Western Europe. We know the story, and we should not be fooled by hearing about capitalism and having us be told that there is something fundamentally different from feudalism or from slavery. Look, there are differences, but there are also profound similarities. Masters ruled over slaves. Lords ruled over serfs. And employers rule over employees. None of them was accountable. None of them was democratic. And capitalism has a lot to account for. Now, let me get at it another way. To shift away from an undemocratic workplace to establish worker co-ops is an enormous social step forward. But it is not the solution to all of our problems. No one should imagine that we have one thing we can do and then everything is solved. It isn't. Let me explain. When you ended feudal manners and you established instead capitalist enterprises, those capitalist enterprises had to work out their relationships one to the other. They had to figure out how to handle the process of a firm going from a small one, you know, an employer and five people working, to a big one, a corporation, when you have a board of directors and 10,000 people. These were problems that had to be solved by capitalism, which solved them in a peculiar way. Every problem was solved subject to the rule that whatever you did to solve the problem could not disturb the basic capitalist organization of the enterprise. You could come up with a rule about what kind of competition to permit. You could come up with a rule that there had to be a minimum wage paid to a worker. You could come up to a rule that you did not allow interest rates to go above a certain level. All of those kinds of rules were worked out to allow capitalism to grow and function. And the same will be necessary with worker co-ops. They will make a revolution against capitalism inside 
the enterprise. And on that basis, they will reconstruct the bigger story, the relationships of competition and cooperation and regulation and so on, but it will be done in such a way that it reinforces the democratization of the enterprise. And in that way, you will see, for example, that they will limit the role of profit. You mentioned, Maria, profit. So let's talk about briefly profit. In capitalism, profit is holy. It's like a sacred rule. Profit plays the role that the Roman Catholic Church played in European feudalism, uh, at least in the West. That it is the sanctity, it is the, the unquestionable rule. Capitalist enterprises must maximize profit. But let me be my economist professor self here for a moment. There is no need whatsoever that profit be the number one or the only objective of an enterprise. That is neither necessary nor logical. An enterprise can have multiple objectives. One objective could be to maximize the difference between revenue and cost, profits. Sure, but another objective could be to maintain employment. Another objective could be to grow in a certain uh, percentage every year. Another objective could be to improve the ecological, natural environment where the enterprise is operating. Another one would be to provide a program of child care for children under the age of eight years of age uh, for the community that works there. You know, let me explain to you that here in the United States, many big corporations are not only pursuing profits. They are, for example, pursuing economic growth. They are pursuing a, a minimum market share that they control a certain percentage of the market and they will accept lower profits if they can get a larger market share, if they can, et cetera, et cetera. It is a, a kind of religious fundamentalism, and I don't mean that in a positive way. It's a kind of religious fundamentalism to imagine that the rule of profit is some absolute. It isn't. And one of the things a worker co-op will be good at, because it allows the workers to be the decision makers, they will have many things they want the enterprise to do because they will not be fixated on the profit. One of the most important reasons why we fixate on profit is because profit is what goes into the hands of the tiny minority that owns and operates business. To tell us that the profit is the number one thing is a none too subtle way of telling us that making them rich is what all of us, the majority, need to do. The answer is we don't. And one of the easiest ways to make sure we don't is to get rid of the minority that runs the enterprises to make them majority run in a democratic way. So I don't have any worry that we will be able in a worker co-op based economy to be very clear, we don't want horrible competition amongst us that destroys industries, that destroys jobs, that destroys the communities where the industry exists that is not able to compete. If there's an industry that cannot do as well as another one, if there's an enterprise that is unable to compete in the usual sense, we're going to have all kinds of arrangements in place to make for transitions from what is effective to what 
uh, from what isn't effective to what is effective. We're not going to allow unemployment. We're not going to allow collapsed regions of a society. We're not going to have all of the horrific costs of competition because our people will not permit it. And because for the first time workers are in charge of enterprises, they will have the power to make sure that does not happen. Okay, that relates to Boyan's next question because, and it is also a question that I wanted to, to pose. So please, Boyan. Right. Uh, thank you. So, uh, Professor Wolf, I, I, I got to say that I particularly like the idea of workers' co-ops, not, uh, not only uh, because of all the arguments that you explained, which are perfectly rational, and, uh, uh, and I appreciate them, but I also want to say that, uh, particularly here in Eastern Europe, uh, although I believe it's the case in the United States as well, we are against a huge propaganda machine, uh, which uh attacks our ideology and our ideas uh and our political concept in general all the time 24 7. and uh, one of the pillars so to say of this uh propaganda offensive is that if we do anything that goes against the interests of the private capitalists they're gonna go and there there aren't gonna be any entrepreneurs and this is gonna be a civilizational disaster to which i always reply pretty much like uh, you just did oh yeah if they want to go let them go let them go let them let them run right now because you know we don't really need these those you know parasitic uh individuals that are just going to uh collect all the profit and and, and you know exercise this culture of terrible exploitation of their uh employees we can just manage uh our uh, factories our services our economy much better if they are out so I think this is really, uh, this is a very important point. Uh, and second, you know, I also... Uh, Could I, I also but, boy, let me just add to that. I agree with you, but let me make a couple of points because we have exactly the same problem here in the United States. You should be aware, if you are not already, that if I were to be asked, what is the secret of American uh, power in the period after World War II, roughly from 1945 to roughly now, or at least until the, this new century. The, the thing that the United States discovered, uh, it didn't know it before, but what it discovered was that much more effective than military repression or police repression, is ideological control. In the long run, but even in the medium run, it is the cheaper and more effective way to support and protect capitalism, to support and protect the inequality that capitalism brings with it wherever it goes, the instability that capitalism brings with it, the economic cycles every four to seven years. The irony is they have taught capitalists in Europe, in Asia and Africa, an important lesson. Just like Europe and Asia and Africa taught important lessons to the United States, the lesson the United States offers is what you just said, endless, all day indoctrination in this kind of mantra, this kind of endlessly repeated song about how private capitalism is productive and anything else is by comparison useless. The irony, the irony of it all is that once you understand what is going on, it dissolves. It's like a mirage on the desert. The closer you get to where you thought the water was, the more you discover there is no water there. This was a game being played in your mind. So for example, if you tax us, we will run away. Be aware, for a capitalist to move is always extremely expensive. 
This is a bluff, like playing in a game of cards. They don't want to spend that money. They are not easily moved, number one. Number two, there is a cataclysmic risk that they spend a large amount of money to move only to discover that wherever they move to will similarly go after them for the taxes or the controls or the regulation. Here in the United States, we have 50 states. Each one of those 50 states wants to tax capitalists who threaten, if you do that, we will leave New York State and go to California or we will leave California and go to Texas. In fact, they don't do it because it is too risky and they are terrified that the state to which they go will then reproduce what happened in the state they left. So when you're done, please remember, yes, a few of them will go, but many of them are bluffing, and many of them simply don't want to have to make a deal with the people of their society to behave in a much more socially conscious and responsible way. Don't be as hesitant to go after them, even on the grounds, and I agree with you, that for many of them to go will allow you to convert those enterprises into worker co-ops and then they can go and be uh, expatriates sitting in London or Paris. Yeah, that's right. And also, I think it's uh, it's it's a very important argument, and I think the left should use that because, uh, after all, uh, the entire society is not there, and the entire economy is not there to just cherish a handful of rich people. The entire society and the entire economy should not be organized in favor of just a handful, like the 1%, or okay, the famous 1%. So this is just, uh, you know, a, a very common sense thing, okay? And even despite the fact that it is, as I just described, a common sense thing, then because of this huge propaganda offensive that we are faced with all the time, well, you know, it's increasingly difficult. Oh, it has been uh, increasingly difficult for the last decades, particularly here in Eastern Europe after 1989, uh, to kind of make that argument, but Professor Wolf, I want to I want to go to something else, uh, you know, that which relates to what you said uh, about uh, the certain element of development that capitalism has actually offered humanity, and I'm talking here about mostly about certain mechanisms, economic mechanisms that I think uh, are the basis for the transition from capitalism to socialism, and one of those mechanisms is planning. Another thing, another thing that the capitalists and, and you know, the mainstream media, everybody gets super allergic, okay? Once you mention economic plan, economic planning or something like that, as if it's something like a poison, like, you know, like the Novichok of economics or something like that, right? <laughs> so, uh, uh, and, and you know, and they all, all always they would always say something like, "Oh, you see, you had uh, the five-year plans in the Soviet Union, and it uh, and it collapsed." Well, first of all, we didn't have five-year plans only in the Soviet Union. We also have them in China, for example, which is thriving economically speaking. Right? That's number one. Uh, number two, planning uh, per se has been with us pretty much since the development of capitalism because first the first factories were really artisans put together okay on the in a big hole under one roof and then somebody would plan their work okay would tell them you you are going to do this you're going to do that and you're going to do this for such and such amount of hours and this is the outcome that i want from your work and so on and so forth. so so there is a plan only the problem is that the plan is only for within the company okay for example the huge corporations that you mentioned they have perfectly organized order within their own ranks, within their company, within their organization. I mean, you know, there were these experiments even in the 70s and in the 80s when there was this first huge propaganda offensive, uh, ideological offensive of neoliberalism, like in, in, in Sweden, for example, they would split a company like I think Saab did this and they went bankrupt like one department would buy something from from another department and then would sell you know the final product to another department that would like put something else on it and that's how they would assemble a car or a plane or something like that and of course they went bankrupt within like four years or three years or something like that so this was just a crazy experiment that's why planning is there uh in 
as a part of the ongoing economic model. The, the, the thing is only that for us, for the society, for the population, for the consumers, for the working class, what's left is the so-called free market, okay? And uh, I, I wonder, what is your attitude towards the concept of planned economy? And I mean, planned economy, not like uh, we had it in, uh, in Eastern Europe before 1989 or in the uh, Soviet Union exactly, but more like it is in China today, where we can see that there are these five-year plans, which basically are not for the entire economy, but for the, you know, the key elements of the economy, the key sectors. And then, you know, once the key sectors, the key investments are, are decided, then the economy becomes predictable and flexible and the other players in the economy, okay, uh, people who own cafes or small grocery stores or, you know, small enterprises, they can, you know, you, you know, they, they can be okay in a way they can be private and they can be, you know, they could be workers' co-ops, they could, they could have all kinds of forms. But the, the most important thing is, that in order to, uh, to de de depart from this anarchic structure of capitalism, we have to uh, uh, we have to switch over to you know planning the m m the economic order within the most important the key elements of the economy. Do, do you agree with this uh, perspective? Yes, I do, and I think that uh, it's part of a slow movement of understanding. Look, the, the 20th century, and even into ours, has been overwhelmingly focused on whether something is better handled by the private sector or better handled by the public sector. And it has become a kind of childish debate in which the fundamentalists, sometimes on both sides, make the, a, a similar argument, except in reverse. So in our country, we have the private fundamentalists who want us to believe that everything done in the private sector is wonderful, effective, efficient, and all the rest, and everything done by the public is inefficient, clumsy, and bad. And then you have people on the other side, a kind of old socialism, if you allow me, uh, which reverses it all. That if you have government control and planning, then you can get good things done, and the private sector threatens or undermines that. We don't need this debate. I don't believe it belongs, especially in a Marxist perspective. We're interested in the relations of production, in the way human beings interact with one another around the production and distribution of goods. It is for us, I think, a detail. Whether the small group of people employing us are private citizens or that small group of people are government officials is much less important than the relationship between those making decisions and those working in an enterprise. That's why I favor the democratization of enterprises, because that's where I come from in terms of understanding what's important. So yes, with that in mind, let me assure you, we should be able to have a rational conversation about what in our society requires planning and government and oversight and that we organize in that way, and what is better handled in a private mechanism of exchange. I have no, I'm not a religious person. I don't, I don't find the market good or bad. The market is a human invention, a human institution, and like every other institution, should be subject to asking the question, is it useful? Is it helping us? Does it need to be changed? Does it need to be replaced by other institutions? There should be no rule that makes those questions inappropriate or unnecessary. That would be censorship, make no sense to me at all. And let me stress two points you made, but to underscore them. We have some of the biggest corporations in the world here in the United States, as you know. They have rigid planning in advance. They tell 
hundreds of thousands of people what to do, where to do it, how to do it. They operate with central planning that a tiny handful of people tell everybody what to do. So the notion that they're against planning is ridiculous. They want to plan everything for the 200,000 workers they employ, but they don't want anyone to tell them what to do. That's what this is about. The criticism of planning is the criticism of those who don't want to be planned, but who want to be planners. And mostly they're jealous of what happened in the Soviet Union because those people had a bigger field to be planners in than they do. Likewise, the China point. It is very popular in the United States to argue that Soviet Union, Eastern Europe, quote unquote, socialism didn't work. This argument is very difficult in the face of China because in China, it's working really well. And if there's a point I want to get across beyond what you've been uh, talking with me about, it's this. You should be aware that the, the great struggle in the world right now is between the United States economy and the People's Republic of China. And you should also be aware that the United States is losing that struggle. And we know it. The people running this country know it. The question anymore isn't, can we stop it? We cannot. It's too late. The question is, what do we do about it? And you have the Trump type people who want to risk the world to avoid where this is going. And then you have others who want to make an accommodation. My bet is accommodation. And the reason is simple. The vast majority of the biggest businesses in the United States have invested hundreds of billions of dollars in the People's Republic of China. It is now, uh, give you an example, Tesla Motors and General Motors, they have invested in China. The future of these two huge corporations is in China. They are on paper American corporations, but they depend on China. You may not know this. I'll give you another example. During the year 2020, Hollywood movies had a larger market in China than they ever had before. They now depend on releasing films in and to the Chinese public. A film in the United States that is hostile to China will not be able to sell in China. And therefore, the films will not contain criticisms of China. You get the picture? The world is shifting. And that shift, you should understand, is going to take with it many of the propaganda ideological notions that shored up American capitalism, and yes, you have been flooded by it, but all of that is about to change, and I want to be the person that helps you see how that is going on. Last point. In the United States today, you will not hear much of this ideology anymore because the failure of private capitalism is so obvious here that even with 75 years of propaganda, it is faltering. We have half a million people dead from COVID-19. They're dead because private capitalism wasn't prepared. 
We didn't have the masks. We didn't have the tests. We didn't have the vaccine. We didn't have the ventilators. We didn't have anything. We have companies that could do it, but they didn't make those things. And they didn't store them in warehouses so they would be available. You know why? Because it wasn't privately profitable to make those things. You know, you would have to make them. Then you would have to put them in a warehouse somewhere. You would have to check that they were kept clean. You would have to check that they weren't breaking apart. You would, And you would have to wait for however many years before. So nobody made what was necessary. Because, you know, that is a public activity. In order for that to work, you have to have a government that takes into account the danger of viruses and takes the appropriate steps. Private profit-driven companies are not an effective way to handle public health. We have learned this lesson with a bitter, bitter loss of people. We have lost more people in the United States to COVID-19 than were killed in World War II. So for us, try to understand this is a catastrophe that we blame on private enterprise, especially because if you think about it, the government in this country does exactly what I'm suggesting. It goes to companies and buys what they produce and then at government expense stores it keeps it, makes sure it's ready for when it's needed. Only the thing that we do in this country that way is military. The government comes in to the gun producer and the airplane producer and the missile producer, buys it immediately, stores it, maintains it, cleans it, and takes the risk that it may never be used. That can't be done by private enterprise. You know why? Because it's in the logic of private capitalism not to make those kinds of investments. In other words, there is no way for capitalism to escape its responsibility for catastrophic failure. And this is changing the whole debate. And that will come to you if it hasn't already. It hasn't, especially in Romania. I think here in Romania, we have what I call some sort of museum of ideologies. Our politicians behave and talk like if it were 1980 again, like it is the Reagan era, you know, we have this idea that we have to privatize everything that the private sector is the best and we should privatize even air. You know, this is the idea right now. And you should see numbers in Romania in terms of poverty, inequality, and people migrating are just catastrophic. But the neoliberals in power right now behave like we are living, you know, the glory days of capitalism. Now, I want to ask you the following thing, because you, are, you were once invited to Fox News. But unfortunately, they were laughing all the time and they wouldn't uh, let you answer properly to one uh, question. I think they wanted to laugh just to make uh, sure that the public won't feel too offended because they invited a Marxist uh, uh, at their show. Now, I want to add the following thing. I mean, we all know that this system failed us and things are not good. But this is also the reason, what I'm going to say is also the reason why many people don't vote left, because they think the left is some sort of Santa Claus, you know, yeah, that the left is selling some sort of magical, you know, uh, solutions. And while I agree that worker cops would be great, it is very difficult to see how can we go from this situation, situation A, where we are in, to situation B, where we have workers, cops? I mean, the folks at Fox News suggested that you are some sort of radical that wanted to 
you know, take the money of the rich people by force and incite to violence because uh, this is uh, how they wanted to portray you. But uh, I think there's more to the story than this. And it is important to explain because one of the reasons why people don't vote for the left is because they think it is uh, some sort of magical solution that would never happen. Yes, I think you're right. Uh, that has been a problem here also. I would let you know, and I'm happy to be able to let you know. You know, you can tell from my white hair that I've been around a while, uh, but I was born here in the United States. I've lived my entire life in the United States. Um, I have never seen this country in the following two conditions. Number one, I've never seen the economic situation as bad as it is today in my lifetime. And I've never seen the American left as strong as it is today in my lifetime. And so that's something for you to think about how it is possible for me to be in a position to say that. And I admit to you, I'm surprised that I'm in the position to say that. I did not expect to see that in my lifetime. So I am in partly amazed, and you will understand, very happy. This is a situation that for me, not the bad economy, that is a tragedy, but the growth of a left, that is extraordinary here. I mean, let me drive home to you. It, ten years ago, we had the Occupy Wall Street movement. For the first time in half a century, a mass movement from below was able to say that the number one problem was inequality economically, that the country was divided between 1% and 99%. They put that slogan on the map politically, so that every politician ever since has to talk about it. An extraordinary movement from below. That movement from below was crushed by Barack Obama, just so you know, since some of you, I, for reasons that mystify us, seem to think that this was some kind of progressive, it was not. Compared to Mr. Trump, absolutely wonderful, of course. But what kind of a comparison is that? Uh, so it's very important to understand that. Four years later, five years later, in 2016, 2015 and 16, for the first time in, in almost a century, a man ran for president who did not walk away from the label socialist. Bernie Sanders. Let me tell you a story. At the beginning of his running, I met with a high official of the Democratic Party. I should mention to you that I personally am a product of the elite schools in the United States. Harvard, Stanford, and Yale, those are the only schools I attended. When you attend those schools, you become part of the very small group of people that sit at the top of U.S. society. My classmate, for example, at Yale for the Ph.D. in economics was Janet Yellen, who's now the Secretary of the Treasury, etc., etc., etc. So I met with a leader of the Democratic Party. I asked him, how do you think Bernie Sanders will do? And he said, oh, we don't know, we don't care. He will not get 2% of the vote. They had no idea how strong the left was. I didn't say anything. I didn't know enough to know then what I know now, which is that the left is much, much, much stronger than they understood. And the same is true now in, in this period, when we have not only the second effort of Bernie Sanders, which in many ways was more powerful than the first one, but we have literally dozens of younger socialists winning elections all over the place. 
Earlier this week on my television show, I interviewed Rafael Bernabe, newly elected senator in the legislature of Puerto Rico. He is a socialist, and he's one of four that were elected there. On, I could go on all day. This country is fundamentally changing. And now to answer your question. What was thought impossible has now become possible. If I had 10 years ago, and I used to do this, if I had said 10 years ago to an audience, there will be socialists winning elections, they would have thought I was crazy. That couldn't happen in the United States. And you know something? I would have agreed with them. It looked impossible. But you know, one of the things people like you and I have to do, and all of the people sending in their very good questions and their very good thoughts, and I'm seeing them in the chat here, and I really, I'm wonderfully impressed with, with all of the thinking that's going on. You and I don't mean here to be a, 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 a church minister giving a sermon, but let me, uh, I hope I don't offend you. You need to be talking, having programs like this, putting out your documents, because none of us knows how the complex historical reality is going to spin out. As people discover that the capitalism they thought was so secure isn't. They're going to be looking for some alternatives. It is crucial that the left is out there with its pamphlets, its programs, its podcasts, its one-on-one -on -one conversations, so that the alternative we offer is part of the conversation. What you saw, and I'm sure you had the coverage, on the 6th of January was the effort of the other side to mobilize discontent in this country. If you know much about the groups that produced the attack on the Capitol in Washington, they are mostly people who have been suffering from capitalism. They wouldn't put it that way. They don't understand it in those terms. They would like to blame immigrants or black people or foreigners or the Chinese. They are given one scapegoat after another. And they are carefully kept away from criticizing capitalism. But the lesson they give us is that the people of this society are no longer supportive of it. They're not supportive on the right and they're not supportive on the left. But the question now is, where will the mass of people go? And I think you will be selling yourself short. You will be giving yourself less credit than you deserve if you don't go out there and talk. Millions of people who are upset when they go to work every day can be won over if you explain to them that the work experience could be radically different, it doesn't have to be somebody else telling you what to do, how to do it, where to do it, when to do it, and then sending you home at five o'clock to leave behind what your creativity helped to produce. No, no, no. You could be part of a community that helps take care of your children, that gives you a chance to develop your artistic skills, your creative skills, your leadership skills. It could be an experiment in developing you as a human being every day. It doesn't have to be drudgery that you endure so you have enough money to go to the mall. These are ideas which people can understand and that they are looking for and will be looking for because the capitalist system that sustains them is less and less able to do it. That's right. I Thank you so much. I just want to say that I very, very much support uh, what you said about uh, the left 
really having to put themselves out there because uh, there's unfortunately a problem that I would describe a, a, a kind of problem of of courage okay we really need to be putting ourselves out there and talking about all these things first democratizing the workplaces second uh cutting the uh working hours uh third uh planning the economy and doing all these things that are indicating a very uh serious attitude towards a transition of an economy a transition of a society uh, so I, I think that's that's crucially important because, as, as you said, and I totally agree here, uh, major transgressions are coming our way and uh, people are going to be looking for alternatives. They already are looking for alternatives and they're going to be looking even more. So, yeah, please, Maria, to you now, uh, since we're approaching the end of our live show today. Yes, uh, well, I see here a lot of questions. And uh, I will make sure that Professor Wolf gets uh, your questions. Um, he already saw uh, what you wrote, and it is much appreciated. Thank you for contributing. Well, now one of the major problems right now is, as you probably know, that there are divisions, especially here in Romania. There were times where I think the, the leftists should the left it would be like a dozen people you know that we used to joke that it takes only like a minibus to accommodate all of us here and still there were so many divisions and i saw somebody ask that a question related to this uh, identity politics versus economics in the leftism because this is one of the main problems as i identify it i mean there are so many things that oppress us. Uh, it is racism, it is, it is patriarchy, it is all sorts of systems of oppression. And unfortunately, unfortunately, for many on the left, they enter into some sort of competition, you know? And there are labels. Oh, you are a tank, or you are um, an uh, identity. Liberal. Uh, yes, or something like that. And it all goes uh, down into a huge coral. And um, I want us to, uh, to have some sort of strategy. How, how did you manage to become popular and to make economy so popular without being dragged into some sort of quarrel that uh, you are not supporting the anti-racism cause or the feminist cause? Here you are a little bit covered because your wife is such a well-known feminist, but <laughs> I'm pretty sure the leftists could come up with the other struggles that you are not covering. So how did you manage to do it? Well, you know, we learned bitterly. We learned from the experience that you have just perfectly well described. We have had the same divisions, the same competition, the same hostility. Uh, we do know, I assume you know it, but we certainly know how hard our government worked uh, to make these divisions happen how hard the FBI and the CIA and all of the rest of them work to make us uh, divided. This is an old tactic of, of government uh, police uh, apparatuses. There's nothing new uh, here. Uh, but we learn that whether it's done honestly by people who are bitterly fighting each other or whether it's done by the, the governmental uh, authorities trying to keep us divided and separated and all that, we recognize what you just said, Maria. We have to overcome it. And one of the ways you, ha you do that, and that we are doing in this country more and more, is figuring out how we can both bring people together because we know that without an organized operation, we cannot succeed, and yet at the same time, respect the differences amongst us, respect that some people want to spend their time fighting this issue, not that one, and that other people disagree. We have to be able to accommodate the differences within the framework of a unity. And by the way, you know, leftists 
have always had this problem. This is not going to go away. There are going to be tensions. There are always going to be people who want to play on these differences to explode the unity. There will be people who overdo the unity and disrespect the differences. We know what the problems are. We just have to understand that they have been overcome in the past. That's what made it possible. And they can be overcome in the future. We have to learn from the mistakes we made under the pressures, and we made plenty. Uh, we're not perfect. We have, you know, we have to learn. I always remind people, you know, one of the great moments in the history of the left was the Paris Commune in 1870. But that Paris Commune led Karl Marx to write a very important series of essays. What went wrong? He loved the Paris Commune. He celebrated it, but he also understood it made terrible mistakes, and those have to be understood. And the pamphlets Marx wrote helped to develop the socialist movement in Europe. They helped to educate Lenin about what he was going to be doing in Russia. So we have to do similar. We have to face what happened in the Soviet Union and be critical of it. We cannot leave the criticism of 20th century socialism to its enemies. Then we will only get their interpretation, and that's not useful for us because their interest is to make sure this never happens again. And our interest is to make sure it happens again, but better next time right. than it did last time. And that's a viable program. You know, I, my radio my radio and television program now goes out to many, many Americans. And I can tell you from the reactions we get that these ideas that I'm articulating are ideas that more and more Americans find interesting, attractive, worth discussing. I haven't convinced them all. I probably won't convince them all. But boy, am I now part of the American political conversation? Yes. And um, until 10 years ago, I was not. And so the, the only reason you know of me is not me. It's because if I go to those elite schools I went to, you end up having doors open to you that are not normally open. And uh, one of the things that I need to do in the years that I have left is to make sure that that door is more and more open for all of you to come through it and to be thousands where we still are coming out of the Cold War in this country, so we still are few. One of the reasons you see me on Fox News occasionally is that if they decide they want someone from our side, they don't have that many to pick from. So uh, you see me a bit more often. I'm hoping and working to change all that. And, and, and that is happening. I, I really do want you to understand that the political situation in the United States is changing very, very fast. What you saw on January 6th is only a small part of how different this country is than you imagined it was. The stability, the self-confidence, the rate of growth of the post-World War II period, that is all over. It's done. It's not coming back. And you're going to watch, I guess, I suspect and I predict, whether it's in Romania or the Czech Republic or Poland or anywhere else, you're going to watch the people that are now confident in their celebration of private capitalism become more and more frightened as they discover that the ground they were standing on is dissolving underneath them. Great. <laughs> now... Um... I'm sorry, we haven't got the chance only to pause, to ask you one, only one question from our viewers. And that would uh, make me invite you here again, because it seems like you have a lot of fans. And as Boyan said, there is a channel that basically um, makes subtitles in Bulgarian for your uh, shows, for Democracy at Work. 
So thank you so much. Boyan. Yes, I, I, exactly. I'd like to thank you for all uh, for all your insights and comments and analysis. And I want to I want to stress on that. I think it's particularly important because in Bulgaria, where I come from, you you got a, a very big uh, you know crowd of fans. Okay, this is like in Bulgaria, you're one of the like absolutely leading media personalities, especially when it comes to the left, but not only to the left. I mean, people that don't necessarily, you know, place themselves on the left. They also follow you and all the translations and stuff like that. So the door you mentioned, it's the door you're opening and you're you're, you're trying to keep as widely open as possible. It's, there are effects of that. So even in Eastern Europe, which is halfway around the world from where you are located, uh, and uh, re regarding regarding all the comments that we've seen, I want to say that obviously we would we will try to uh, make Professor Wolf come back on our show maybe uh, sometime in the you know, foreseeable future. And we're going to ask all those questions. Plus, we're going to send them. We're going to collect them, and we're going to send them to Professor Wolf. And perhaps uh, you're going to find some time uh, within your uh, program, your uh, your Ask Professor Wolf show that you have occasionally. Perhaps some of the questions are gonna um, are, are gonna be uh, well good enough to sort of deserve your uh, attention uh, also there. Uh, so thank you once again. Uh, thanks to our viewers, uh, and uh, I want to wish you all uh, well, you professor, a very good day, and the others here in Europe a very good evening. Stay healthy and keep fighting. And don't forget to go to our Patreon page and support us because we really need your support. We are a small independent media, still struggling, and we need you. So please go to our Patreon page and uh, please subscribe and support us. Thank you so much. And let me only add that I, I would endorse and urge you all to make a little contribution on the Patreon page. Barricade uh, is something that needs to be duplicated, replicated, and grow. Uh, it's in our interest to help it do that. Uh, so I, I'm very honored by your invitation. I'm flattered by your interest. I'm a little overwhelmed by all the comments to see that people are engaging, right? You know, agreeing and disagreeing, which is fine. Uh, and if you would like me to come back, please know that I would be again honored and happy to do it. Fantastic. Thank you so much. All the very okay. best to everyone.